Hello, everybody. My name is Mike Stroh, and this is the State of Mind podcast on Radio Region Park. And today we have two very special guests from Not 9 to 5, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves and tell us why they're here. So I don't know who wants to go first. Sure. So um, say hi, tell us your name, tell us everything about you. <laughs> <laughs> How much time do you have? Uh, so my name is Hasala Villas, and I'm a co-founder of Not 9 to 5. Um, we are a community organization, Canadian, uh, locally based in Toronto, focused on mental health and addiction in the hospitality, food, and beverage industry. Mm-hmm. And I run Not 9 to 5. I'm Ariel Copeland, uh, co-founder of Not 9 to 5 with Hazel. Great. Nice to meet you. So Nice to see you. Nice to meet you. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I've met them before, I promise. Um, <laughs> So maybe you can share with us um, a little bit about how it started um, and how you got here, and then we'll go from there. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, so I'm a chef by trade, and uh, I've, I've grown up in the industry. Uh, I've been cooking professionally for about 15 years now. Uh, my whole career mostly was spent towards opening a restaurant uh, about five years ago. I opened a restaurant called Thoroughbred Food and Drink. Um, And after about a year and a half, two years, I realized how miserable my life outside of work was. Uh, You know, in terms of my my day-to-day, I would, you know, work a a 15-hour day and I would go home and work a little bit more. I had very little work-life balance and uh, this is something that was instilled in me. When I wasn't working, I was feeling guilty. Um, and as this was happening, I, I was started hiring, um, and trying to approach things a little bit differently, kind of stepping outside of the situation and, uh, taking a look from the outside. And I realized I didn't want my, uh, cooks, the younger generation of, of guys coming into the industry, guys and gals coming into the industry to be faced with the same, um, you know, normalization around it as I had. Uh, and so we, we immediately changed to a four day work week. Um, and limited the hours and limited the amount of work and, and responsibility that um, these people had. And in doing so, it you know made a pretty immediate impact. Uh, and then not long after that, I actually had a cook um, at my restaurant try to kill himself. Um, and, you know, I hate to say, but he wasn't the first person in the industry who I knew tried who tried to kill himself or succeeded. I mean, he, he luckily didn't, but uh, I, I've known several people who have uh, passed away by suicide and it's been really a devastating thing. And so um, as this was all coming into play between, um, you know, my own revelations and, and looking around the industry, I, I really felt like something needed to be done. Um, so Hazel and I hosted a panel uh, discussion. So it was a kind of, I don't know what the exact idea behind. We just wanted to speak about it and I wanted to have industry come in and, you know, different uh, conversations happening. So I got, you know, five or six different people from walks of different walks of the industry, uh, sommeliers and events, you know, chefs, restaurant owners. Um, and everyone kind of shared their truth because everything's a little bit different. Everyone's truth is a little bit different. Um, and it was such a powerful moving panel that uh, after afterwards, Hazel and I really decided that we needed to continue on. It couldn't be a one-off. It needed to be something that we needed to actually uh, make a, a mission of, of changing. Wow. Uh, before you tell your side of that, of um, how did it go from, like, how did you even think to do the panel? Did you say, hey, Hazel, we got to do this? Or what? how did that come about? Hmm. Yeah, it was, uh, you know, I, I just felt like, the, the biggest concern and frustration I had was the fact that no one was speaking. Mm-hmm. And I always feel like community is uh, one of the strongest things that people don't utilize. And so I wanted to really bring together a community of people who are interested in talking about it. I wanted to bring together ideas. And we did. We, we shared so many ideas. And everyone's truth, like I said, yeah. even the guests, when they were speaking, their truth was so different than everyone else's. Um, and so just hearing all the different angles it was such a a brilliant fascinating thing yeah wow cool and where was that done in a restaurant that was at uh, thoroughbred food and drink oh wow nice cool yeah amazing all right so 
<laughs> my version? Yes, please. Um, my side <laughs> of things. So I grew up in the restaurant and hospitality industry as well. I got into it at 17 years old and felt that mental health and addiction was a topic you didn't talk about. You lived it. You experienced it. You witnessed it around you, but you didn't ever have a conversation about it, especially not in the workplace. I lived with it, um, again, pretty much the same time as I started in the industry. I really started to have serious challenges with my mental health. Years later, I was able to get diagnosed and have a vocabulary of understanding about what was what I was feeling. But as a teenager, I had no idea. I grew up in a family where you didn't talk about those kinds of things. So it was a huge epiphany to understand like, oh, okay, no, I'm not quote unquote crazy. I live with, you know, I suffer for, I have challenges with depression and anxiety and uh, in the industry, it's so prevalent. Um, um, and I think back to when I was in my 20s, I had managers and bosses that definitely had their own boatload of issues as I did too, but we would never have a discussion about it. And I always was scared that I would get fired, actually, if I ever brought it up. Um, fast forward years later, and I went to the panel that Ariel's talking about. It was... Um, titled Let's Talk. So really the whole premise was to get people talking about this, which I thought was so brilliant. Did you know each other before that? Yeah. Okay. We, yeah, yeah, we've known each other for a while. Yeah, we've known each other for a long time. Um, Ariel is really good friends with my youngest sister. Okay, and so right. for a long time I knew of him and then we met when I used to do the Toronto Underground Market. Yeah. Um, Ariel was a vendor yes, when he was trying to launch Thoroughbred. Yeah. yeah. Cool. So he's what we would call our yeah. Tom alum. Um, so... Yeah, so I always was front of house in the industry. I did every job that you can think of, host, bartender, server, all the way up into owning a restaurant. Um, and again, just it never was a discussion. So coming to this panel was the most refreshing, huge weight off my shoulders, being in a room of people who were talking about all of these different topics. And um, it was such a small group, but it was such an intimate conversation. And I definitely remember coming up to you after Ariel and being like, I don't know what your plans are with this, but I need to keep having this conversation mm -hmm. because I'd had this conversation with friends and family and colleagues. I'd never had this conversation with random strangers and just so openly and publicly just saying the words, I live with depression and anxiety. You know, it was just such a huge, it felt so good to just say that out loud mm -hmm. and not feel ashamed and not feel embarrassed and not, it was nerve wracking, but it, I wasn't embarrassed. I didn't, and it could, I could tell in the room people, you know, had their own experiences. And so it was a very, very, very cool night. And so that was kind of the birth of not nine to five. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And it's interesting. It took us after that, it took us several meetings to even definitely. decide exactly what you know, where we were going and how we were going to proceed and what, uh, you know, our core values were. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there were so many pivotal meetings and ultimately I, I think we both knew what we wanted to do and we were on the page and aligned for so many things, but then, uh, you know, just flushing out like any business and, you know, really not nine to five is a business in the sense that, um, you know, it's a, it's a charity. We need it to run well. And, you know, we kind of both approached it like that. And, you know, as a result, we have a uh, super, like a, a really good amount of clarity and what we want to achieve. Yeah. Like I, I would, it's not like a profitable business. I think when we say business, we mean that you'd approach it with the same responsibility Definitely. and efforts that you would when you are creating a business. Exactly. Not so outlining, like you yeah, said, business yeah. values and yeah. forecasting and stuff like that, but not for profit. It's just, you want to give it the same level of seriousness as yeah. you would to and a profitable business. I think that's the other and professionalism. Yeah, I exactly. think one of the big things we identified is that there's so many people who start with things like this that just fall off because they're passion projects. This is a serious passion project for both of us. Um, but in approaching it with that mindset that it's we're approaching it like a business, um, I think that's really driving us. Yeah. I think that you, you mentioned that the reason a lot of those things don't end up lasting and having substantial weight behind them perhaps is because they are not handled in a way that is business oriented and then it often falls apart. I think that's a huge one. I think personally that's mm -hmm. one reason why 
I'm also trying to do all this as a business. Mm -hmm. um, one, because I we were talking about this the other night. I, <laughs> I don't know. I wouldn't know how to do it otherwise. Like yeah. I have such a little amount of awareness of how these things actually work and run. I'm learning, but um, yeah, I think that's a great approach. And oh yeah, I think the there's a movement in the nonprofit world to help perhaps find different ways for nonprofits to function so they're not so dependent on the older models or whatever. Absolutely. To, yeah. Funny enough, we yeah. were actually yesterday at a boot camp. Uh, it was a legal boot camp about charity taxes and charity law and um, uh, figuring out exactly what yeah, we're talking yeah, about right yeah, now. Yeah. Because what I realize is that by doing no outgoing promotional or PR or very simple social media, yeah, yeah. Um, even just the basic, basic output that we've, you know, started, the in, the result of it is so huge. The impact, the people that have come to the response from the community has been so massive that I, it quickly became apparent to me that we need to set up a good foundation yeah. and set this up properly, legally, accounting wise, financially, all of the things like, again, business wise that you would do, because if we don't have a strong foundation, then we can't grow. Yeah. And we can't keep adding layers and you know, we're both former serial entrepreneurs. So <laughs> we're full of ideas and all the amazing things that we want to do. But, you know, in order to execute on those ideas, you need that strong foundation. Yeah. yeah, it needs to be scalable. Yeah. And I'm curious maybe I mean I have a f not I have some experience of working in restaurants. Um and I'm well aware of the problems that some of the waiters and bus bus people or uh, even cooks had mm -hmm. um, I don't know what can you describe some of the just inherent challenges or maybe the lifestyle or whatever that are conducive to substance use and perhaps mental health issues like how does that all Manifest. evolve in a restaurant because that yeah. it's so interesting uh, when Adam Geller put us in touch. Yes, oh that's my right. God, this is so cool. <laughs> Obviously, restaurants and bars and clubs and all these things, you know, this is a huge issue and it's never really been discussed. There's a lot of mental health discussions going on about all kinds of things, but mm -hmm. this is the first time I've ever heard it in that context, which is exciting. Yeah, totally. It's amazing. I mean, yeah. It's, um, our industry is, is um, someone put it that uh, there's a lot of dark corners to hide in for <laughs> for addiction, abuse, well said. mental health. Yeah, and, well. you know, it's the thing about it is, first of all, the lifestyle. Um, it's long hours, very tedious, hard work. Um, it's a culture that's very military uh, mm -hmm. in nature. So, it, you know, it is a lot of um, abuse. It's a lot of, um, you know, you have to prove how much of a, a man, so to speak, you are or how um you know you're you know you're able to take on this work that yeah you're you're a cook now you're a real chef you've worked you know just to give you an example like i've done more than one shift from 9 a.m on saturday to 6 p.m on sunday straight through like no break no stopping to eat i've done more than one shift like that and it's acceptable because um that's the culture that has come come up from us over the years and so um, hold on do you, did you sleep at all or no, no? sleeping no Jesus. that's what i mean i mean it's, it's yeah, 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 yeah. and that's like the weird thing about it is that you know the owners and so the restaurant is like 24 hours or something you know what you it's not even we had uh, or you're yeah. cleaning so and we you're had and brunch on saturday yeah. and so i was there working brunch and then dinner service on saturday night yeah. and then we had a brunch party on sunday and we just didn't have time to get everything right, done right. that we needed to get so it's my hey, gosh yeah um <laughs> And you know what? It's just, it's people never looked at it like it was a problem. They would look at it like it was a rite of passage. And as a result, I mean, it, it just fosters all these horrible, horrible um, habits. I mean, no, not eating for 12 to 14 yeah. to 16 hours is normal. You know, you'd think that people who are serving you food <laughs> have time to eat. But a lot of places, they don't. You know, and it's so busy that they don't, they're not yeah. given that opportunity. Yeah. And so, you know, there's all sorts of eating disorders that it breeds. You know, I would go two, three days without eating and to realize it, be like, wow, I'm not hungry at all. But I'm, I realize now that I actually haven't had a meal for two days. And like, that's kind of a crazy realization. Yeah, no kidding. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to talk on some, some more, but I mean, anxiety is a big one. You know, depression is, is a huge one. The addiction side is, is kind of an easy one because... 
uh, after someone finishes work in the evening, it's like 11.30, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock in the morning maybe, it's like, okay, well, what, what are you going to do? It's like, okay, well, you're not going to go to a movie at that time. And, mm-hmm. you know, you're not right, going to go right. play bingo. Yeah. You're going to go to the bar and, you know, you're working with alcohol. You right. may or already... drink in the restaurant exactly. when it's closed, yeah, right? Yeah, 100%. I think that happens a lot. Um, and then, you know, someone who comes in super hungover the next day, it's like, oh, that's just George. George is, oh, he's just, he's in rough shape, but that's just George. He's yeah. having a rough go. And it's like, well, shouldn't we talk about George? Like, isn't there <laughs> right, something right, a bit right. more than that, right? Yeah. Um, so I think that there's always been this connotation that chefs work hard and play hard. Mm. And I, I think that for us, it's about, no, well, we got to change that approach. That's not okay. Like, yeah. you know, I mean, it's it's uh, happening more and more in other industries. Why isn't it, why isn't mm-hmm. this change happening in our industry? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah well, that's amazing. I just wanted to say about the... Basically, the only job I ever really had was being um, a festival producer, basically. So Mm -hmm. in that world, we spend a couple weeks every season or every half a year where it's like that 16, 18 hour days. Mm -hmm. But it's only for that amount of time. That's right. Which is so it's contextual and it's it's still not ideal, but it's like, okay. and I think even in, in any industry, it's okay to have a day or two here and there where you're not sleeping and working nonstop. But when that's like normal, consistent part of the lifestyle, yeah, then obviously that's a big, when I think big also problem. Yeah. The, the bigger part there too is not just the lifestyle, but it's the expectation. Right. And I think that's right. the hard part. Where AKA peer pressure. Yeah, peer pressure for sure. Or your yeah. boss basically laying it out, like you said, as an expectation. Yeah. Um, yeah. As a, I've also been a festival producer and event yeah. producer, and I always had that ironic thought of I work throwing this huge food event, you know, and for hours everyone's eating except for me and my crew. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it yeah, made no yeah. sense. And eventually it wasn't until I had this amazing volunteer who was our kitchen manager who would start feeding us. Because he was so appalled by the fact that we were all working yeah. so long. And he had come from that world as well of being raised by not eating. And yeah. he just was so appalled by all of it. And so he, was, he took it upon himself to feed us all. <laughs> but that took years for us to figure out, a year and a half at least. You know, wow. yeah. the first month, year or so of that business, yeah, we would run around like chickens with our heads cut off, not eating, and coffee and, yeah, you know, coffee. all kinds of other yeah. bad life decisions. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, I... Um, as a front of house, it's the same thing. You work till three in the morning. You get home at three thirty. You're on this huge. I always describe the high you get after a service because it either goes one of two ways. So either you're like high because it was such an incredible accomplishment that you were able to serve hundreds of people and so many tables and your sales were X, you know, number of dollars yeah. and you killed it with tips and it was like this huge high. Or it was an awful night and it was terrible. Um, and you know, but either way, you're still coming off of having to do it, go, 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 go for all these hours. And either way, you're getting home and your mind is racing and everything's, you know, you're still on that go mode. Yeah. And it's really hard to come down from that without substances. And so oftentimes people rely on the substances yeah. to come down from that. Mm-hmm. And that's why you get that kind of everyone's going out after work or they're going to after parties or they're going to someone's house. And then the next thing you know, the sun's out and walk a shame home. And, yeah, you know, yeah. so I, I found that it was such a quote unquote normal part of being a bartender or a server was the inability to come down from that. And then my other kind of issue with the industry was that you're constantly thinking about others. So there's this output and there's no input. You know, you're thinking about your staff or your crew. If you're an owner or a manager, um, if you're a server or hostess or bartender, you're thinking about your customers constantly and everyone else or your boss, what they need from you. But at no point is it about how you're doing, you know, and there's this amazing ability you get from hospitality to wear a mask. And it's not about how you feel inside or what you're actually dealing with. It's just about service with a smile. And, you know, there's an old adage that says something like, uh, you know, you're doing a good job in the service industry when you don't hear any negative feedback. Right. And it's like, okay, so there's there's no positive at all. It's literally just no negative. So exactly. We must be doing something right. And, and that's just, a huge problem yeah. because especially if you are dealing with so many mental health challenges or yeah. a mental illness or addiction challenges, then 
you've got this amazing ability to hide it. And like Ariel said earlier, our industry does attract a lot of people that want to hide. It's a really amazing place to hide. It's really easy to hide. And you get this incredible skill set of how to hide. Yeah, wow. Because of the mask. and Because of the mask that yeah. you have to put on, to, especially for front of house, that you constantly have to put on to mask. You know, it doesn't, you check your emotions at the door, you're here to, you know, Yeah, I was curious, I wanted people. to ask you, yeah, about that, how the... The what, what the customer service side of things plays into that, and how you know, as a customer of a restaurant, a lot of times, well, I I shouldn't say you get a wide variety of personalities oh, as yes. servers of and as, yeah, <laughs> and as um, hostess or host, you know. It's a nice people. way to put it. Yeah, and so I guess. <laughs> My God, I mean, it's not easy to deal with people either as a, as a server. Yeah. And so you're constantly sort of having to negotiate personalities and, and all that kind of stuff. I, I mean, it, it was the one of the main reasons why I never wanted to be a waiter or why whatever. Laughed. I was yeah, a busboy. Yeah, why you yeah. Uh, yeah, I was a busboy here and there. Uh, but yeah, dealing with people, my goodness. And, I, and actually, wonder, sorry, yeah. one more point yeah. that I wanted to add. You were talking about how you would run these uh, festivals yeah. and it would only be a certain time of year. Yeah. So this is something I also talk about often in our industry that people don't seem to understand and why I personally think like back of house, like chefs, like it blows my mind what they're able to accomplish on a daily basis. I don't, it's a very underrated skill set to be able to execute a similar menu or dish consistently day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, and be flawless almost every time yeah. about what you're actually pulling off. It's right. There's almost a magic to it. It blows my yeah, mind no what doubt. chefs are and able to do. Like 10 dishes at a time. Right, right exactly. And the chits just keep coming, coming, yeah, coming, yeah, coming. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, I've, I've, it's always something that's amazed me. It yeah. never ceases to amaze me. But it's to funny. add to that, Sorry, one tiny thing is what I don't think people understand is that normally in the entertainment industry, you know, musicians go on tour. Yeah. Theaters put on a play and they go on tour. Everything's on a calendar limited edition time frame. But with restaurants and bars in hospitality, there is no tour. There is no end date. This is day after day constant and I think that's part of our industry what I've realized is that adds to this is that when does it end yeah. you know and so it doesn't end so understanding that it doesn't end how do can we accommodate a better workplace for our staff knowing that this is just a consistent output that needs to keep going yeah, yeah I think that's a gosh. big thing is the you know it's not that it takes a lot of money to change the perspective. It ta takes a, a change in your perspective. That's right. I mean, I, you know, ultimately speaking, I started implementing some things that, you know, really didn't cost a lot of money. I approached Good Life, and they gave us a, a group discount. Um, and so all of a sudden, we had a discount for Good Life, and I was trying to encourage all the, all the uh, employees to try to get physical and healthy to, you know, get out there. Um, you know, the four day work week was huge. I did it for back of house and front of house as well for a period of time and they made the decision to switch back and some of them stayed on. I mean, um, but when everyone was on four days, you, you wouldn't believe how happy they were. <laughs> um, and like just, just changes like that, you know, staff meal and making sure people eat and yeah. listening to people. You know, I think that was a big one is absolutely you know, just taking a second out of your day and saying, Hey. You know, how are you? Like, what's happening? And then actually listening yeah. to what they have <laughs> yeah, to say yeah, in yeah, response. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Active it's listening. Big, active listening. I mean, it's interesting. Now uh, we're getting to a point where, you know, I'm actually, you know, we've talked about um, rethinking that a little bit and just saying, okay, well, um, it's such an important part to have that. So, you know, maybe as a, as a result, these small restaurants, 15 people who don't have HR departments, maybe we should say, okay, well, look, dedicate one hour out of your day or two hours out of your day every day and just say, okay, look, my door's open. You have my ear. Like, you're able to come and approach and talk to me about whatever you need for that one hour, two hours. And again, it's not like you're going to be breaking the bank on anything. It's literally just your approach to your staff. Yeah, and I think that actually... There's no research necessarily, although it's starting to happen, I think, is that actually probably saves you money and makes you money. Oh, huge. Because, yeah, Absolutely. because the morale goes up and the... Yeah. Retention. Yeah, retention. Retention, wow, yeah, the culture was, was so, 
like so much better when that was you yeah. know just everyone felt like it was you know someone cared and I think that's right. the big thing is that there's so many places where uh, staff are to, made to feel like they're disposable yeah um, yeah and, and then the, the customer service I assume for sure Oftentimes, yeah. how you treat your staff, your yeah. staff will treat your guests. Right. It's a very much a trickle-down effect. Um, and then to add to that, I would say another thing in this industry that's always been very prevalent, and I'm starting to see change a little bit, but it still definitely happens, is rewarding your staff with substances. Um, so there's this whole post-shift uh, beer, you yeah. know, that kind of gets put in front of you when yeah. you're done. Or this, uh, uh, you go to the walk-in, and there's like staff beers available. Or or other alcohol, you know, or other type of What's substances. What's the walk-in? What do you mean? Oh, sorry, the walk-in is a the like the deep fridge. The fridges that you can oh, actually yeah, walk yeah, okay, into. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, walk yeah. Walk-in fridge or freezer. Yeah, or that's right. Yeah, yeah. That's right. A walk-in fridge. Um, but I guess that's industry industry term. slang there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is yeah just go to the walk and help yourself right, right. like help yourself you know and mm -hmm. and the discounting of alcohol for staff i think is a bit of a problem because you're enabling yeah. people to reward themselves with a substance and then that, that's building a habit and so for example i think back one of the worst quote unquote worst examples of this uh i worked in a bar when i was in my early 20s where our quote unquote staff meeting involved every couple hours, we would duck under the bar, you know, if it wasn't too busy, and we would take shots of wild turkey. And that was like our high five, woohoo, we're so awesome, you know, yeah. quote unquote staff meeting. And <laughs> so, that, you know, I look back and I'm like, that's crazy that my manager was handing me shots of bourbon every couple hours to, you know, reward me on my great job yeah. that I'm doing. And anyways, so I think it's kind of cool to think about now I'm starting to hear more owners um, and managers calculate how much money would we be spending or how much are we spending on this type of reward system and instead let's use that money in a different way so there's some bars in toronto doing like wellness credits for example so there's a bar called mahjong in toronto and they offer their staff fifty dollars every month to every single person so you don't get it in cash, but what happens is you can bring in a receipt and anything to do with wellness, you'll get reimbursed $50. So you can use that for a gym membership. You can use that for therapy. You can use it for a yoga class, massage. You choose how you want to spend it. Um, but I think that's such an incredible way to spend money to invest into your staff and a workplace that doesn't involve rewarding with alcohol yeah, no or other because yeah, there's no HR in the service industry, is there? No, well, maybe the in big hotels, places. Right? Or, yeah, or, larger, larger restaurants. Large like, restaurants, yeah, yeah uh, hospitality groups and restaurant groups. Yeah. yeah, right. So, but and and what would be the scale of their operation? Like, well, like these, picture yeah, a place like the Drake exact. Hotel would yeah. would definitely have HR. That's okay. right. Yeah. Um, you know, anyone that owns multiple places, like uh, you know, Inc. or Iconic, and like like they have uh, Oliver and Bonaccini, Chase. Yeah, they would definitely have HR. Right. Uh, if you go to a mom and pop shop, there's a good chance they do not have HR. Yeah, which is yeah. reasonable, I guess. I yeah, mean, for sure. Or, or I guess the owner or the manager is the HR person too, right? That's right. And yeah. so oftentimes what happens is it either doesn't get addressed or it's the last on the list because you as an owner operator you know we know from personal experience you're drowning in operations and just trying to keep the doors open and yeah. keep your mind sane <laughs> yeah. Yeah, <laughs> you know yeah, yeah. my gosh yeah it's a it's a tricky one for sure i mean it's um I, I think a big part again is not necessarily having to spend more money to, to view things differently. Yeah, I think that's the part that we're really trying to drive home with people because it's all approach and tactic. Yeah, I, I think um, one of the amazing things that my when I one of my mindfulness teachers always gave us as homework is curiosity. Practice curiosity and imagination, and it's oh, how could this be different, or how could what could this look like, even if they're r silly ideas or whatever? I think that's a huge missing component of people's approach to handling these things a lot of the time is, oh, wait a second, it doesn't necessarily have to be like this. And exactly. maybe we could think about it differently. And I guess in the service world or restaurant world, you, it's amazing that these things are starting to happen. You guys are part yeah. of that. Um, that's super cool. What? So what... Um, 
So it's been about a year, or the one year anniversary is in June, which I just found out. And so what else has happened um, since then? Uh, so we had a launch party at the Drake Hotel late May last year. Mm-hmm. And that was just a way for us to kind of be very vocal about who we are, what we're trying to do. We invited some of our friends from the industry, like Bar Raval and Richmond Station, Woodlot, IQ Food, to come and make a dish and also pair it with a non-alcoholic cocktail. So it was very interesting experience because... Was it I, at night? or It was at okay, night. Yeah. There was a bar. Like yeah, you could yeah, definitely yeah, go yeah. And, and order a regular alcoholic drink, which yeah. is... It, again, we're not saying don't drink. Yeah, totally. It's just yeah. more about offering alternative options. Yeah. Um, and, and, the, and the environment that it's okay to acknowledge if something's going on. Right? Yeah, exactly. 100%. And so for me, I mean, I thankfully have not really you know had any challenges with addiction myself but i know that i you know often will slip into the default mode of oh okay i'm just gonna get it i'm just gonna have a drink because i feel like i have to and that night it's very silly and that night i never really was i'm not i'm much more mindful about it now but last year i realized that night at the end of the night i'd been holding drinks all night and I had not had a drop of alcohol because I'd gone to all the stations and tried all of their drinks. And it was such an amazing epiphany to have to realize I had just as much fun. I feel great. Mm. You know, I didn't, no one brought it up because I was holding a drink in my hand all night. And it was not a conversation. It was just the way it worked out. And it made me realize how powerful that is. And it's so cool Huge. to see places now in the city offering non-alcoholic cocktails. Well, and we had some friends come out that were um, and and are sober, and the comment kept on coming back to like, you know, these events are so hard generally to come out to because um, they're usually sponsored by alcohol companies, and alcohol is in your face, and alcohol is everywhere, and you know, from the people that were saying, it's like this is the first event we've been to where that's not the focal point of what we're doing. Yeah. So, I mean, I think in that sense, it's been, it was really powerful. Uh, and again, oh, eye-opening, I think for me as well, like, you know, definitely, it's, it's just a game changer. I mean, like, do you want to go to a bar if, if you can't drink? And a lot of people don't, but right. then there's things yeah. being introduced like seed lip, uh, which is the first non-alcoholic uh, distilled spirit. Uh, they were actually our sponsor, who were that, our sponsor night. that night. So yeah. what does that mean? Sorry, non-alcoholic distilled spirit. So it's, it's a picture you know, it's it's created the exact same way um, a spirit would be created. Like they have a version that's similar to a gin or vodka. Wow. Um, just with no alcohol, and wow. it's it's Crazy. not like non-alcoholic beer where I'm yet to try one that I like. It's actually quite tasty. Yeah. It's really delicious, and because we gave it to professional mixologists, they wow. made cocktails that had just as much effort yeah. and com- you know, complex yeah. Um, yeah. Like, flavor profiles mm-hmm. as, for example, a bourbon Manhattan would have. And so that was really amazing. Mm. Like, you know, Robin Goodfellow, one of the quote unquote best bartenders in Toronto yeah. was there and he made one cocktail. It was absolutely incredible, yeah. incredibly delicious. I could have drank like seven more. All right. So would it actually taste like vodka or something like that? Or how did one like, of them taste, taste something? quite a bit like gin? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So oh, yeah. Because it has the botanical. The botanical that's yeah, right. The flavor garden. profile. Wow. That's it's very vegetal. And that's right. You're right. Wow. That's wild. Um, it, um, anything. Is kombucha, kombucha, or something yeah, like that? Yeah, that's Similar fermented. That kind of, so, uh, is that different. the same kind of thing, or no? it's different because that's also carbonated and fermented. Okay. Seed lips yeah. not fermented. Okay. So, seed lip is is just the liquid, so, yeah, like it's distilled versus fermented. That's okay. right. The yeah, fermented, yeah. you get that kind of funkiness. That's and then right. The distilled is like really that alcohol kind of flavor profile mm-hmm. that you get. Mm-hmm. Right on. Cool. Um, so in addition to the launch party, yeah. we've also hosted a gospel brunch fundraiser. We, we had some great DJs come out, raised some good money. Oh, and a gos- So did you have a gospel choir? It was a gospel theme. Okay. So we cool. didn't have a choir. Okay, Maybe no, next time. Like, Whoa, <laughs> Maybe amazing. next time. Yeah, 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 yeah. that would have been yeah. amazing. Because oh I went to actually once in New Orleans. A gospel brunch like yeah. that that was mind blowing. Um, so maybe okay, one day. Yeah. No, yeah, okay. I was, but we had yeah, yeah. Um, DJ spinning yeah. that kind of music. Cool. So Amazing. yeah, wow. it was really awesome, and we hosted it at Thoroughbred. Yeah. Um, 
And then... And what, so was it just sort of a, a brunch or was there talking or nothing? Sort no, of, we really yeah. used it as a fundraiser yeah. and all of the money we made from that brunch fundraiser, yeah. we were able to then hire um, Kate and Nina from Mind Matters. Yeah. And they helped us build a workshop all about how to keep calm as fuck. I really just swear. <laughs> how to keep calm <laughs> AF um, at work. Right. And our whole workshop was around anxiety in the workplace. Cool. And we tried to make it industry specific. Uh, yeah. We co developed it with them, um, with our guidance, and then we were able to host it. So traditionally, these workshops cost anywhere between, you know, 50 to $75 per person. Yeah. And we were able to offer it to people at $25 a person. Um, and so that was kind of the thinking behind the strategy of why we raised that money. Cool. Okay. So the gospel brunch led to the, to the workshop. Uh, and that I'm assuming is what a few month span, six month span. Like, is that was that the last thing? Well, you were sponsoring the event the other day that we were at. That's right. So um, was that the was that the next thing after the workshop or? Well, we, it's funny. We have so many things on the go, kind of concurrently. Um, we are working on um, a better practice guide. Um, wow, so to speak. So super cool. Yeah. So there's going to be a, a few different parts to it. But, yeah. Um, so better. Pr so just for the lay people. Of course. Yeah. Like what does that mean? Better practice. So it's going to be a free downloadable yeah. PDF. Okay. And it'll probably end up being a few pages. We don't want to make it too extensive yeah. either because, you know, then it's overwhelming. Yeah. Keep it super user friendly. And uh, it's aimed at managers and owners. And uh, it focuses a lot on uh, management principles and, and ideas and basic conversational, um, you know, requirements. And uh, I think the big thing is, is, you know, what we're finding is a lot of people don't know where to go for resources or how to ask for help. And so, again, it is a way of thinking and it's you know we're trying to really fill the gap that's there right now um, I think as well cool. like it kind of goes back to what we were saying earlier about knowing that a lot of small to medium sized businesses in our industry don't have HR departments yeah. or even one person doing HR or if they do HR their main focus is just hiring and firing yeah. <laughs> um, it's not really based on like workplace culture yeah. um, knowing <laughs> that we were kind of thinking like how can we empower people to feel like they can start to have a conversation about these topics at work you know without feeling like oh I'm just like I'm so overwhelmed with like making the schedule and yeah. managing all these people and now you want me to like have these huge heavy deep conversations about mental health and addiction in the workplace like how do I even do that where yeah. do I even start yeah, yeah. and and, you know, thinking of myself in that position, having a guide like this is huge and so helpful because, you know, you've said this before, Ariel, and I think it's the best way to kind of put it is it's just a nice way to start the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. We're not mental health professionals. No. We don't claim to be. Yeah. Uh, this guide is not going to be like, hey, all of a sudden you're a certified mental health. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's not that at all. Right. It's, no. It's more than anything. The approach that managers need to start taking within our industry uh, to see positive results and change. And it's the start of something. And that's the point, I think, getting, getting people started with it. Yeah, and the amazing brilliant. thing yeah. is it's like an onion because as you unravel one layer and we're like, okay, broader practice guide. Yeah. Now we've already started to plan you know and put into the pipeline like five more additions to this that we yeah. want to add because we realize oh what about this what about this oh what about this oh they're going to want to know about this topic too and they're going to need to know like legal advice and they need to figure out workplace accommodations and what is a workplace accommodation and you know all these things start yeah. to come out so i think this is one of many well <laughs> yeah no it's uh man crazy that's super cool um yeah i think I think this uh, makes sense. Is uh, in addiction recovery, a lot of people describe the experience of um, looking for a solution or a way of living, uh, a manual basically, or like a better practice guide to life. Right. And and the substance, the substances are that better practice guide. And then all of a sudden, you know, you enter into recovery and in some ways depending on what that looks like for you a lot of places will hand you a better practice guide it's like here is what you can use to live your life and in a way that is not as it used to be um, and personally that was 
incredibly helpful for me and I know a lot of people. I think it's even, in some ways, it's described as a design for living or, or whatever it is. And I, I wonder how much of it is people's unawareness and ignorance, not in a bad way, just lack of awareness or, or knowledge. And when they're presented with things like that, the skies part sometimes. Like, oh my God, here's an answer. Here's a solution or a instruction guide or a whatever it is. Yeah. Absolutely. I also think like, so just to think of it, not in the, from a management or owner perspective, but also from an employee perspective, yeah. I think if I came across this, you know, in my younger twenties, I could have brought this to work and used it as an excuse to start the conversation, yeah. you know, and handed it to my manager and been like, have you seen this? Have you heard about that? Like, can we start to talk about these yeah, things yeah. instead of it just feeling like it's coming from me mm -hmm. and making it about my experience? And maybe I'm not ready to talk about living with anxiety and depression or other, you know, disorders, but yeah. maybe now this is kind of my excuse yes. to bring the conversation to work. Yeah, that's super cool. I bet I want to see it when you make it. Cause, yeah, that's super cool. It's almost, yeah, it's such an un... It's just the start. Yeah, but it's also an un unexplored market, if you will, or um, population, or I don't know what else to say. I, and I, I think about what are the other places? Um, some of the, one of my clients in particular is a huge manufacturing company. Oh, and so okay. they're having a ton of issues with substance use in the factories, and right. especially in remote communities. And anyway, um, so that's another area that Probably nobody really thinks about, but definitely this is, is workplace everywhere, in general. But service and yeah, one and of the that. challenges I think with restaurants is the margins are so slim to begin with for <gasps> Absolutely. owners. It's you know I think uh, Restaurants Canada came out with something last year, the year before they said it was like average three percent or two percent uh, profit margin, and so if you think about three percent, two percent profit margin, there really is no room to try to increase spending on anything. You mean from uh, an side. like for your oh like so from you mean if you were to pay to support for sure and so right. like you know if you look at like law firms or you look at tech companies there's been such a, a positive uh, movement in yeah. in wellness and right. a lot of it I think has to do with the fact that they understand the the direct correlation between productivity results and you know wellness yeah. and you know I, someone said that Netflix. Um, were allowing their employees to take as much time off as they wanted. There was no like two weeks, three weeks vacation. It's like take as much time as you want. <laughs> and it's like, you know, once you understand the results are there, it's like just get the job done. I mean, obviously the service industry, you can't give people unlimited time off. Yeah. Um, but how do you convince owners who are making 2% margin, if that, or break even, or losing money? I mean, as a business, like as a restaurant owner, like, I, you know, I get it. I understand that. And that's why I think for us, it's really about just being creative within and, and you know, how to find the wiggle room. And a lot of it is, 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 is the answers are there. It's just about we're not accepting the fact that we're uh, on a day to day basis following these rules that are archaic that have been given to us, you know, 20, 30 years ago. Like even the tipping structure. Who knows when's that, when that's from? Right. Like yeah, no one yeah, knows. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. You know, maybe 30 years ago. And so why are we still following that? And you so know? what would... I, that's a great topic. It's a bit of a side note, but <laughs> I would like to explore that with you too, since you're <laughs> experts in the whole thing. Yeah, because it's... It's really hard. Yeah, no kidding. So, uh, well, so from, maybe start from there. Yeah, yeah the, so from the point that yeah, it, it this, does relate the structure to the structure that is now. Yeah. yeah, so I think tips are a hard thing because um, there is no financial stability. Mm -hmm. There are very few restaurants that have financial stability, and money is the, one of the leading causes of anxiety uh, and, and mental health yeah, problems, no, right? Yeah. Absolutely. And so if you can't bank on the fact that it's going to be a good night or a bad night, you don't know what you're walking can't plan. into. You can't plan. And so, I mean, right there, that's a huge source of anxiety. Um, and so it actually does, it does kind of walk hand in hand, even though it's not one of our things that we want to tackle because sure, you know, yeah, trying yeah, to tackle yeah. the no, whole of course. Yeah, no. yeah, 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 yeah. A, yeah. You know, the consumer needs to be ready for change. And I, I don't think consumers are ready for change. You know, they're not, I think in theory people are, but I don't think. Yeah. In, so what are some of those potential different ways of that? Because I know in Europe, the mm -hmm. the tips are sort of included in the cost of the food. Mm -hmm. Australia and, too. Yeah, and so tipping is almost 
negligent. It's not yeah, or yeah, or they're kind of not existent, or like you're North American, <laughs> right? The second you leave a tip on the table. Yeah, but yeah. So is that one yeah, way I mean, that it could go? That's a great way, and then everyone gets paid better, right? I mean, yeah. It's ultimately speaking, but again, you know, using a hamburger as an analogy, hamburgers right now for a good restaurant are already like twenty dollars. You know, yeah, like as a plate. Yeah, like yeah, you get a, yeah. like a homemade, you know, home, like ground beef that's yeah. been ground in house, maybe a homemade bun. It's like a twenty-one, twenty-two dollar hamburger right yeah. there, and it's a good hamburger. But if you have to think about that, okay, how much do we have to add on? Do we have to add on that thirteen, fifteen percent, twenty percent in addition to that? So all of a sudden, that hamburger that was early twenties, does it go to late twenties now, or is it going to like, <laughs> you know, it's it's kind of a crazy thought. Yeah. Are you willing to pay twenty-eight, twenty-nine right. dollars for a hamburger? Yeah. Probably uh, not. Probably not. Yeah. But even if you know that the cooks and you know the servers and you know everyone at this restaurant is getting paid better, so it's a it's not something that it's such a complex issue. It's yeah. funny. I was talking about this at that event we were at. Yeah. <laughs> because there's an article that Cor or sorry an article series that Corey Mintz is now doing in Toronto Life. I don't know if it's I guess it's monthly because Toronto Life is monthly. Um, where he breaks down the cost analysis of a dish. So the first one was the pastrami sandwich that Anthony Rose does at Rose and, Rose and Sons. Thank yeah. you. I'm like, what's the deli called? <laughs> um, it's an $11.25 sandwich. Um, that's the cost for the customer. Yeah. The cost to make that sandwich is eleven dollars no sorry he costs sorry he charges customers eleven dollars for the sandwich it costs eleven dollars and 25 cents to make so he actually loses 25 cents on every sandwich wow there's zero profit you're actually going in the red negative yeah. to make this and it's one of the most popular items on the menu oh my gosh and so the idea is what they buy condiments and drinks and whatever. it's the food like, cost it's the labor cost is the overhead he breaks it down so right, but how do you so then what's well, the so, yeah it would be i guess in that case a loss leader where people would be coming in the doors and spending right. money on okay. other things like exactly yeah, you right, buy right, cocktails right, right. you buy other things okay. yeah. um and, and but that's volume. really common yeah. But that's really common in this industry, and people, the customer doesn't understand how much food actually costs. No, and, definitely not. Right? And so the problem is, too, with ingredients, is that there's constant supply chain fluctuation, price fluctuation. Right. So oftentimes, avocados cost one price, and then another time of year, they cost double, you know, or limes are another one. Oh, yeah. Cauliflower is a great one. Cauliflower. There's the big cauliflower really? epidemic. Yeah. yeah. When I was at, I mean, every single item, limes right yeah. now is celery. I don't know. If you knew that, but right. celery is on. Like, you would know more than right me. Wow. Yeah, I mean, it's funny because uh, wow. at Thoroughbred, one of my staple dishes there was the kung pao cauliflower. Right. And uh, there was a period of time. So cauliflower, on average, say is like a dollar fifty to two dollars. There was a period of time where it was six fifty. And so ultimately, speaking, and you can't charge the customer that. No, do you think the customer cares that it's? Yeah, yeah. 60, you know what I mean? No, they don't yeah, care. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Not at all. So, I mean, wow. Yeah, that's. That adds to the stress and the complexity of it all, too. Right? It does. And so oftentimes I would say the first thing, if an owner or manager is questioned on these things about workplace culture and mental mm -hmm. health and addiction conversations and what are you doing for your staff, you know, immediately I, I can already see on their face they're thinking, like, I can't afford anything. Yeah. yeah. And so it's so great that you keep, Ariel keeps pointing out the fact that a lot of the changes that we can suggest that you make actually don't cost anything. Because right. the first excuse is usually that, yeah. that they have no money and actually it's true they don't yeah, no have kidding. any money right. like as yeah. we just pointed yeah, 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 yeah. out they're not lying they're not exaggerating yeah. it's not that they don't want to spend money they literally don't have anything yeah. extra and so it is important to just understand that things can be different it is possible it doesn't have to be the way it's always been and it doesn't have to cost you anything yeah. one of the interesting things as well that we we touch on and we're going to be doing a workshop on it eventually is um, actually from the owner side mm -hmm. That stress around financial stability is crippling. It is honestly probably, you know, the most intense type of stress that I've ever felt. And, uh, you know, every single owner, and I mean, not just restaurants, but any business owner who, yeah. and, I mean, even at home, if you're stressed about money, you know, it's, it's a tough one. And to be in that position of power, the owner, you know, who's dealing with that and also have to lend ear to people, that's a, that's a really hard toll to take on on yourself and so i think one of the things we do really try to you know make a point of mentioning to people is that it always starts with you taking care of yourself that wellness really needs to come from the top 
in in you're setting the example, but you're also in a good enough place that you can talk to people and you can't just take on more and more and more because that happens so much where people just get to a point and they shut down and yeah. it might be a conversation that people are having and that person you know the owner is checked out completely and they're not even paying attention because they just can't take on any more yeah yeah that's a big one and then the way that they treat their staff suffers because of that and huge yeah, huge yeah. and you can't like Arl said you can't take care of your staff if you're not taking care of yourself yeah, yeah. man trickle down uh, oh huge yeah it's huge and i think as hmm. an owner or manager anybody in a place a position of authority or leadership i think we often underestimate how much influence we have there was an article that came out recently by dave mcmillan who owns joe beef in montreal it's one of the country's most famous restaurants anthony bourdain featured it on I his think, show is he interviewed Obama on cbc <laughs> Pardon? He, uh, yes, he was. I heard that interview. It was really fascinating. Right. Yeah. So he he's talks. In recovery, right? That's and, right. Yeah. And so he talks a lot about coming to that epiphany and understanding of realizing how much influence he held and right. holds. Right. And how much, how the owner or manager takes care of themselves yeah. or doesn't take care of themselves, how that impacts everyone under them that looks up to them. Because even if you don't actually look up to someone, they still influence you yeah. in some way yeah, or yeah, another. Yeah, yeah. And so it's really interesting that now we're starting to talk about that more and understand um, and feel more empowered and realize like, okay, no, how I talk to myself, take care of myself, how I eat, you know, drink or don't drink or, you know, whatever I choose to do, I actually do have eyes on me. And I have yeah. people that are looking, that may, some of them might not, I'm not that close with, but they're still watching me. Totally. And it's kind of cool that he talks about that. Yeah. There's a, you know, the famous saying of monkey see, monkey do kind yes. of thing, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yes. And we have to get all... We're wired that way. Yeah. Well, we have mirror neurons, they're called, which actually... That's how we learn more so by action and behavior rather than talking. Um, and yeah, the owner or the leader has such a, they're sort of the buck stops with them, right? So if they're not, uh, if they're also hiding, because I think in that interview he talked about how, I don't know, some, he knew a recovery coach or something like that who had intervened with some of his employees over the years or whatever. And then one day, the coach showed up somewhere. Yeah, he said, it's your turn. Yeah, it's your, and, he, and he was just like, okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, because he knew it was coming kind of yeah. thing, of I course. guess. Yeah, that's an interesting... I didn't get to hear too much of the interview, unfortunately. But yeah. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it happens all the time, and I think sometimes mm -hmm. people get so caught up in it that they don't even understand it's happening. And it, it, get, it goes back to being so busy on a day-to-day -day and having very little time to reflect and, yeah. it's you true. know, about your personal needs. I think that's such a huge one. And, you know, with him, especially having such a successful, busy restaurant, you know, it's just life. It's just a party. And there's always, it's just, it's just, and then <laughs> at what point does it become, okay, well, now we have to address this, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's the thing for us is that, you know, there's a real line to be drawn in the sand there. Yeah. Wow, there's a great saying in the recovery world, uh, rationalize, justify, minimize. It's kind of like what you were saying. Oh, it's just this, it's just that. Oh, it's not a big deal. It's okay, I'll do this to tomorrow, blah, blah, blah. And it goes on and on and on. Um, so what, so we are actually getting towards the end, which is wild. Um, so maybe what's up next, I guess, or what are you, so you got the guide in the works and mm -hmm. the volume one of many. Yeah. Uh, yeah, what else is going on? Yeah, because I think for us, the goal is to decrease stigma yeah. by building more of a conversation or adding more to the conversation and connecting people to resources. So I'm someone that believes that everyone, you know, sometimes needs or wants different forms of treatment yeah. and resources. I don't think it's a one formula fits all. 
um, when it comes to mental health and addiction. So I, I personally think it's really important for us to continue to reiterate all the different options that are available to people and not just be like, go to therapy or start to exercise more because it's not that simple, yeah. right? Yeah, everyone yeah. has a different truth. Everyone like has a truth. Like thing. for me personally, for example, like I'll share, it's about 14 different things that I have to keep on top of to quote unquote feel good, you know, and keep my, like manage my depression and anxiety. Mm -hmm. And of the 14 things that I'm, you know, meant to do, sometimes I don't get to all of them, but I notice immediately, you know, so if, if you want to like lay out just a few of them, like diet, exercise, meditation, um, financial, you know, managing my finances, yeah. all these things contribute, uh, sleep, you know, um, so I think that for us, we want to continue to really push on laying out the variety of resources that are out there and available to people and um, constantly reiterating how many options there are available to people um, because, I, like I said, I really believe that it's different for everybody and, and you have to just really try them all, yeah. you know, and yeah. play around and figure out, okay, which ones work for me, which ones don't. Um, and... So the Better Practice Guide is being launched at Terroir. It's a hospitality symposium that happens annually in Toronto. That's amazing. Yeah. So mm. we're kind of trying When's to... That? It's May 6th. Holy smoke. So soon. Very, Very soon. soon. Yeah. Which is kind of good because it gave us a deadline. <laughs> it forces us to finish so it on no, time. So no, it's really exciting. Cool. Um, so May 6th, chills. that will be available to... <laughs> we'll be definitely trying to share that and get everyone to download mm -hmm. it and you know read it and share it as much as possible. In June, we're having a one-year anniversary party yes. um, aiming towards the end of June to kind of just celebrate the fact that it's been one year we've been having this conversation. Yeah, we, uh, we're starting with uh, regular meetups, so every few weeks. Um, basically just a place where people can get together and talk, and it will be um, like no judgment at all attached to it. And, you know, again, everyone has a different truth, and it, more than anything, it's going to be like, you know, what's going on? How are you? Yeah, we haven't announced this yet, but that, yeah. that is something that we have in the works and we're really excited because I think that oftentimes um, one of the best um, tools or I guess like things that help you when you're so isolated and alone or suffering is connection yeah. and community. And so we had this kind of epiphany of realizing like people just need to be together. And we got asked also, I got asked personally by a lot of people, like, can we just bring people together? It doesn't have to be an event. It doesn't have to be about mm -hmm. anything, but just be in a room where it's safe and inclusive and okay to not be okay. Yeah. Um, we did uh, kind of like a meeting, but yeah. not. Yeah. yeah. We yeah. did something with Academy of Lions, um, which was, um, focused around mental health and addiction and CrossFit, uh, lift up. And so we, uh, we're going to be doing something with them once a month, uh, which is again, just an excuse to get out and do some CrossFit. And it was my first time last time. And you're busy. I, well, my it's legs really... felt like jello afterwards, <laughs> which is wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that is a really uh, awesome resource that we're able to share with everyone is that this is a CrossFit class that happens once a week at Academy of Lions. And it is designed actually for people that are living with challenges around their mental health and or substance abuse or addiction and it's a free class so oftentimes a CrossFit class can cost up to $20 yeah. for every single class or to join a gym could be you know thousands of dollars a year but this is a weekly option that's completely free and open to anybody it's not on Wednesday afternoon is it it is yeah. Yeah, Wednesdays I know, I know, uh, do you know ammo no, but I know a guy named Brian who works down the street from here for an inner city health clinic for st. Mike's I think he he takes people yeah he was, yeah, he he was, was sort of one of week. the yeah, he was I don't know if he got it started with them or not or whatever, but he is an incredible human being, that guy. Yeah. So the trainer yeah. is also an incredible human being. Yeah, so I he, who's been running the program for three years, yeah. and his story, the first time I met him, I was almost in tears as he was talking because I just couldn't fathom how much he's done in the few years. Yeah, you know? amazing. So cool how the world's connect and collide oh, sure. and whatever. Yeah, so they wanted us to help kind of promote it and now yeah. we're going to be there once a month. Um, yeah. But definitely. It's, it's there every right. week, but yeah. we're going to be doing the not yeah. 9 to 5 once a month. Right That's on. right. Um, and I, 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 one other thing I was kind of curious about is 
I don't know, maybe it's different back of house, front of house kind of thing, but the inherent nature of the service industry is people are relatively friendly, right, and social, and and that um, I think is a net positive thing, right? People want to be talking or they are want to be around people and being social and being out and having a good time, and so that seems like that might be a positive part of all this, is it might not be as difficult as other I don't know what you would call it, industries, to get people to be willing to hang out together and talk. I don't no, know. absolutely. Is that... I mean, it's it's a double-edged sword mm -hmm. uh, because yeah. I think a lot of times now the reason people are hanging out and getting together is booze and Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and you know what? You're absolutely right in saying that people are social and want to be out. I, I do think there's a, still a, a huge stigma and taboo around the mental health side of things, which is what we're really trying to break yeah. down Massive. and show, hey, guys, it's it's not a big deal. Let's get together. And if you don't want to share, you don't have to share. And if you don't want to yeah. talk, you don't have to talk. But let's get together and at least you can listen. Yeah, so. which is beautiful. I think a huge part of meetings or just being able to talk and being able to listen to other people and to feel. That's the thing. We need to feel what's happening inside us and in other people and by hearing and listening we generally have opportunities to do that exactly so it's super cool but in our industry i find that we don't do that a lot and because it's just like go go, go exactly go, 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 go. And then this is a very new conversation yeah. and like arl just said there is still so much shame and stigma so you would think that because we're socializing. Yeah. Oftentimes, right, there's right, a right. lot of us in this industry that are introverts. Right. And the socializing is part of the job. Yeah. And an, or and or the mask yeah, that I was talking the, about yeah. earlier. Because the mask is whatever it's it a, is, right? It's for just that a strong muscle. Yeah. Like I can flex it and I can do a lot with it, but it's not necessarily really who I am. Yeah. And so, oftentimes, when I'm not working or when I'm not doing events, when I'm not doing all these things, I actually don't want to be out in the social settings, yeah, yeah. talking <laughs> and putting on that mask again. Like I I do not have FOMO anymore. I'm not in my early 20s anymore. Yeah, yeah. So um, <laughs> when I do talk, I wanna have real conversations. Mm -hmm. And I, I just from personal experience, I've found it quite challenging often because a lot of people, they don't want to feel, as you said, yeah. you know, and be in, the moment and connect really connecting mm -hmm. with each other that's just exhausting to some people and or just terrifying yeah, yeah you know and so i think we still have a long way to go and this is just we're planting seeds yeah and maybe the harvest will be even we Who may knows? not even be able to witness the harvest yeah. and i'm okay with that because sure. it's not about you know, us, it's yeah. about just really building this conversation in the industry. Yeah, I mean, we've had Amazing. this discussion, actually. I, I think that one of the reasons I love the industry so much is because it is a generational thing. So we know that the next generation is going to be better than us because we're teaching them to be better than us. We're teaching them from our mistakes. And so if we can embed this conversation into that, then, you know, the next generation is going to be well equipped to deal with it. So or just see that yeah. there is another alternative. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, it yeah. doesn't have to be Gordon Ramsay yelling at me, throwing pots at me, and you know, flinging things at the bartender. Oh, there is another <laughs> way to run a restaurant. <laughs> yeah. No kidding. My gosh. Okay. Well. Thank I guess, you so yeah, much yeah. for having I us. Say thank you, everybody.